So tonight, we're going to look at two people. One of them is called Philip, and the other one's called Nathaniel. I was praying um, the other day, which is quite good. Just trying to impress you now, aren't I? <laughs> well, it was a long time ago. I was praying, and I just had the word Nathaniel come into my head. And a lot of the times, when you're a preacher, you're always thinking, God, what do you want me to say? That's quite a popular prayer of mine. It's in a bit of a panicky voice quite often as well. God, what do you want me to say? So um, all I had was this word, Nathaniel. It wasn't particularly dramatic. So uh, here I am preaching tonight. And I've done a little bit of um, research. I found Nathaniel in the Bible, which was quite a good place to start. And uh, I thought then we could sort of look at him and Philip and unpack a little bit of what uh, God might be saying to us. So those of you that don't know immediately where Nathaniel is found in the Bible, it's uh, John chapter 1 and uh, verse 43. John chapter 1 and verse 43. One thing that always strikes me is that um, when the disciples are impacted or meet Jesus, something very, very dramatic happens in their lives. When the disciples meet Jesus, or shall we backtrack a little bit, when the fishermen met Jesus something very dramatic happened in their lives. So when the tax collectors met Jesus, something very, very dramatic happened in their life. Or when the prostitutes met Jesus, something very dramatic happened in their lives. When the lepers met Jesus, something dramatic happened. You, do, you get, do you get the, uh, the, the theme of what's happening? And I, I was never quite sure. Obviously, Jesus did a lot of healing. Um, but with the disciples, um, they didn't come to Jesus and get healed, did they? You know, I don't think any of the disciples was sick, uh, the 12 disciples. None of them were sick when they came to Jesus. They were spiritually sick and they needed a savior, but none of them were physically sick. But I found something, and you, you would all know this, um, but I found it, and it, it, it impacted me. Um, and I want to just share this with you before we look at Philip and Nathaniel, because very often we think these guys, they're just walking along the street, la da 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 uh, they've done, played a bit of football, talking about the rugby, da, 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 walking along, hi guys, and they meet Jesus, oh hi Jesus, yeah he's the saviour, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, oh fantastic, yeah we'll just follow you, well, we'll chat about the football and we'll walk along, and our lives, their lives didn't seem that dramatically changed, or did they? Because I'm under the impression that when we meet Jesus, our lives dramatically change. And I'm just wondering whether what we're seeing in our day is the same as what they saw in their day when people's lives were dramatically changed when they met Jesus. And I think I've spotted something that we might, we might, it might help us. So if you look at John chapter 1, because you're in John chapter 1 anyway, and John the Baptist is going on uh, in uh, verse 19 through, he's going on about Jesus and they're all saying, oh, John the Baptist, you must be the Messiah. You must be the one that they've called. Da, 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 da. They're all going on. Poor old John the Baptist. And he says in verse 26, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one that you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, if you carry on, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Fantastic, isn't it? Um, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. So there, and now he's saying to all the guys that are around and the people that he's baptizing, here he is. This is the one. I told you about him. I wasn't going to be able to undo his thongs of his, not the thongs, but the thongs of his sandals. And he was great. And I'm just a baptizer type guy. But this is the one. 
Verse 31, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So John recognizes he's a forerunner, and we all know that about John the Baptist. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove remain on him. Because John was sort of there at the baptism, wasn't he? Was he? He was there. He was there, wasn't he? He was... Although Jackie and I went to St. Fagans the other day and we saw, uh, we went into a Catholic church where Jesus was being baptized by John and John was tipping a cup over his head. But anyway, and I was going a bit, oh, that picture's wrong. It was a 15th century church, so we couldn't just paint on it. So then John gave his text. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain in, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you will go, I I don't know, what does that mean? Well, do you remember Jesus said at, at the end of the gospel, remain in Jerusalem and wait for the gift my Father promised? Remember that? And the Holy Spirit came in power at Pentecost. But here we have something that's absolutely fascinating for me, is that Jesus was going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Right there and then. Jesus wasn't the forerunner to the Spirit. Jesus was going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And when you meet Jesus something dramatic will happen in your life. And I want to just check tonight that you've met Jesus and something dramatic has happened in your life. Because your life will never, ever be the same again. Do you know why? Because your life no longer belongs to you. It belongs to him. And do you know what a lot of Christians do? Hello, me included. We keep saying, this is my life. No, no, I don't want to sacrifice. No, I don't want to do that. No, I'm struggling to do that. I'm in control. And when the the fishermen, (coughs) the tax collectors, the prostitutes met Jesus, their lives were totally transformed. And I think for us as a church, we're starting to enter into a place of transformation. And that we're saying to God, okay, I will if you will. I'll I'll, I'll move towards you. We're going away from this whole idea that we do it on a Sunday and we wear our best suits and all of this stuff. That God, through Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit, will totally transform your life and and this is what I believe we need in this day and in this time if you're transformed your family will be transformed the woman or man that you live with will be transformed and I'm concerned that sometimes we come into this spiritual environment and then when we go home We just fall into the old pattern, the old pattern, the old systems, the old ways. And I believe that God has got more for us. And I read this, and for some of you, you might go, John, get on with the sermon. I've got football to watch. But but this is, is life transforming. That Jesus came and he baptized in the Holy Spirit those early Christians. And there weren't many of them. And I believe today that there's not many of us. But there's getting more. And there's good things happening in Wales. And the church of Jesus Christ is growing. And I'm concerned, and God uh, gave me a picture when I first came to the church, and it was of an aeroplane. And some people are going to be in the... um, the bit where you wait for the plane. Thank you, Jackie. Departure lounge. 
Some people are going to be on the buses and the cars trying to get to the airports. Some people are going to be sort of checking in. And there'll be some people that will be on the plane ready. Come on, Lord. Come on, I want this plane to take off. And I believe one day in Wales, and I'm going to keep preaching this and keep teaching this and keep trying to live it, but one day in Wales, this plane's going to take off and that God is going to visit this land again. I believe it. It's not a made-up story. I believe it. Thank you, James. The sooner the better. And we've all got to be on that plane. And I know that there'll be many churches where they're not even near the plane. And I'm not going to judge or criticize anybody at all. But I believe for us, we've got to be people that are saying, Lord, where is the plane? Because when it takes off, you can't go running after a plane. You might run after a train. Those of you old romantics where your loved one was on it and you were running on with the flowers. Come on, darling, and throwing them through the window. You can't do that with a plane. Can you, Ken? If Ken's late for his plane tomorrow, he ain't going to catch up with it. Are you, Ken? And if he's overslept, Margaret will be telling him because Ken's going on holiday tomorrow, but he's going to have rain in Turkey and we're going to have sun here. (laughs) Fantastic. So quickly now, we're going to look at Philip and Nathaniel and have a a short reflection on it. Jesus was beginning his ministry. Now, I I dispute that um, the first miracle was Jesus turning water into wine. At the, and I know it says it here, um, this was the first of his miraculous signs. But I think the first miracles were calling the disciples. The first miracles were the salvation of souls. And the first miracles were that people saw Jesus as he really was. And for Philip and Nathaniel, firstly, Philip sees him. Finding Philip in verse 43, if you've got your Bibles open, they decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to them, follow me. Now, I'm going to suggest to you, and it's not written down here, but from what happened to Philip and uh, the following and the martyrdom and everything that took place with these early disciples, I think that when Jesus said, follow me, Philip was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he followed Jesus. And he would have followed Jesus to the very, very ends of the earth. Something happened to Philip when he met Jesus. And I've got this song going around in my head. I'm not quite as far back as you, Val, from your baptism. But it's a song and I'm not even going to sing it. I'm going to tell you what it is. Just one touch from the king changes everything. And I got that song going round and round in my head. I used to have 80s songs, Duran Duran and Spando Ballet, but now I've got these uh, choruses. I'm getting more choruses going round in my head, but just one touch from the king changes everything. And for Philip, and I don't know much about him, and I've tried to research him, but I can't because there's not much about him. But Jesus says to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him. Do you know when you're touched by the king, you don't want to keep it for yourself. You want other people to experience what you've experienced. Is that fair to say? Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Verse 46. Nathanael answers. (laughs) Now I'm going to dispel a few myths now. Oh, sorry, Nathaniel answers, very, very well-known phrase. Can anything good come from there? Nazareth! He probably shouted it. I'm not going to shout it. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? 
Nathaniel had a very, very negative attitude. Do you know why he was negative? Because Nathaniel was from Canaan. Canaan was four miles away from Nazareth. And apparently in Nazareth, there was some sort of Roman, uh, Roman fortress or fort, or it's where the Romans used to hang about. And the, the, the Canaanites used to look down on the Nazarites. It was like a, a really rubbish place. It was a place that no one really wanted to live. It was a place that people really didn't particularly want to go to. And I want to say to you this evening that there's a lot of people with very negative attitudes towards things. I, I've lived in Caldecott for 13 years. And you know, there's a lot of negative attitudes towards Caldecott. Caldecott is where the workers come from. Mega is where the, the bosses come from. They're the, they're the ones that, that they used to run the steel works down there. But Caldecott, three bed, semi land, and they're all, um, they're all from the, the factories and uh, the, the, the steel works and the paper mill and uh, over the munitions factory, and they've all come over here. No one, no, nothing is good here in Caldecott. And you know, I believe that this is an undercurrent of negativity that lives in our town. And people that live here very often feel that they cannot do anything better than what they're currently doing. That they cannot achieve anything better than they're currently doing. And I want to dispel some of these myths that you and I might believe about the town that we live in. Young people that live in Caldecott, people say to them, you want to get out of Caldecott? It, it, it isn't a good place. Jackie used to live in St. Kenneth and up the valleys. And pe all people say to people like that, get out the valleys. There's no work. There's no good. Everyone's on drugs. Everyone's drunk. Well, I want to dispel a few of these myths. If you quickly turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 31. One Corinthians one, twenty six to thirty one. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify those, the things that are, so that no one can boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. God chose the lowly things of this world to shame the wise. Please, 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 don't put yourselves down. Don't put yourselves down. You might not have the, the greatest um, academic levels. You might not all have degrees. You might not be able to uh, pronounce long words. You invited someone to preach uh, this morning, and she was doing a crossword yesterday, and she said, What's, um, what's a dry desert? A what desert? A cold desert. So is me and James sitting there. She said, I, I, I just need this and I'll be able to finish the crossword. A cold desert. You invited this lady to preach this morning. She said, how do you spell deserts? What? Well, do you know what it was? It was a cold dessert. And it transpired. It was a trifle. <laughs> it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But you know what? God speaks through us. Whoever we are, whatever our background, whatever our history, whatever problems we've had, whatever difficult, God speaks through us. 
He spoke through Philip. He spoke through Nathaniel. He spoke through Peter, Paul. All of these people that were, that were, were mess-ups. He's spoken through the prostitutes, the lepers, the blind, the deaf, the robbers, the thieves. He's spoken through all of these people. Stand up tall because he's called you a man and a woman of God. Don't put yourselves down. You might be from Nazareth. You might be from Caldecott. You might even be from Newport. But you know what God showed us? Do you know what God showed us? Jesus was born in a stable. And he grew up in Nazareth. Isn't that wonderful? And that God allowed his son to come into the mess up, into the squalor, into the dirty environments and become the king of kings and the lord of lords. What else have we got? This is really good. I don't have a week to do my sermons. <laughs> Verse 47. You see, Nathaniel is very, very negative. Are you negative? Are you negative about what you can do? What you look like? How you can cook? What your whites are, are white? A lot of people in church life are very negative about their own ability and struggle because they might be criticized. We don't do that so much now, do we? I, I do criticize you, but I just don't tell you anymore. <laughs> and you don't criticize me, you just, you do, but you don't tell me. Do you know there's a real lovely spirit of encouragement in this church? It's lovely. And you know, none of us are a, a top level whiz kids at anything. I'm not... Um, I don't know the Bible inside out. My Greek's pretty rubbish. My Hebrew's almost non-existent. But you know, we're doing our best. And we want God to take us to the next level. And Nathaniel was extremely negative about Jesus. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching in verse 47, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite. In him... There is nothing false. What a lovely statement. Jesus could have had a right old go at him. But he said, here is a true Israelite. He probably kept the law of Moses. He probably had the old uh, um, circumcision after the eighth day. He probably did all the, the right things on the right time and the right way and stood in the right way and washed his hands and did all, all that type of stuff. In verse 48, Nathaniel asks, how do, how do you know me? Well, Psalm 139, 13 to 16. He knew you before you were born. He knew you when you sit, when you stand. He knows every single thing about you. You know when you feel lonely, you feel lost, you feel helpless, you feel a bit rubbish, you feel a bit helpless in lots of different ways. He knows everything about you. How do you know me? And then Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called me, called you. He saw him. It was a personal. Jesus saw what Philip was doing. You know, that's not that dramatic a statement, is it? I saw you under the fig tree. I've seen you before. 
So I wonder why Nathaniel then answers in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. What a statement that is. Jesus hasn't declared who he is. But Nathaniel has been reading the Torah. He's been reading the law. He's been understanding that we're waiting for a Messiah to come. And we have the Messiah. This Messiah has now come. And we know him. And we realize that he's here. And he's died on the cross. And he's risen again. And we know all of these things. And it's wonderful, isn't it? It must be wonderful for us. For Nathaniel, it was a bit confusing. For Philip, they weren't really sure. But when they saw Jesus and he looked at them and he said, come follow me. And Nathaniel recognizes who Jesus is. You are the rabbi. You are the teacher. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you. I saw you under the fig tree. You shall, you shall see greater things than that. Verse 51. Then he added, I tell you the truth. And this is lovely, this, this last verse. So powerful. You see, we, we exist in a, in a, eat our food and watch a bit of telly, meet our family. But you know, this heavenly dimension, this spiritual di dimension in our prayer life, in our worship life, we, we, th there's other places for us to go. I tell you the truth. You will see shall see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And I, I looked it up because it, it's not quite that straightforward. But what this verse says to us is that it shows us the true nature of Jesus. It shows us the nature of Jesus through the cross, through his death, through his resurrection, through his ascension, and then his return. Ascending, descending, the angels are all around. The glory of the Lord shone, the, the, the angels, the trumpet blasts, the return of Jesus. You see, we've got to get ready for this time. And we've got to get ready that Jesus is going to come back one day. And we can read passages like this and we can say, yeah, this is great, it's good for Philip, it's good for Nathaniel. But how does it impact our lives? And Jesus, when he said to these guys to follow him, I believe that Jesus baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And these guys were never the same again. They were transformed. And they, most of them, if not all of them, went through to martyrdom. Nothing stopped them. And they were martyred for their faith. And I think it was our James that said to me this week, there are more martyrs today than any other points in Christian history. But I believe that in those places where people are being martyred, the church is probably its strongest. And I'm going to ask you tonight, what's your response to receiving the Holy Spirit once again? Asking God to baptize you again in the power of his Holy Spirit. Your, your life won't be the same. It'll it, it'll take you to different places. Your life won't be the same again. It'll push you on. Things of a negative nature, things of a self-critical nature, will start to fade away. Because then you'll be able to see who you really are in Christ and who He has made you. In Christ. All the negative stuff is, is of yourself. But who you are in Christ is beautiful. Who you are in Christ is beautiful. Saved. Sanctified. 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 Made holy. 
not because of your self-efforts, but because of the blood of Jesus.